Dr. Steed is our representative from our Davy campus, um, and he's been on the board for a period of time, been very active with us, um, he's gone to Washington, does champion for us in the Davy County area. And um, very interesting, he is also, or was, a superintendent of schools, and so has a real uh, understanding of higher education and has been really one of our um, advocates. Today he's going to introduce our speaker, Dr. Williamson. If I found, sound like a frog, it is because I think I am one. <laughs> um, right after Thanksgiving, I got the, the crud of, 19, of, of 2016 that is now extended into 2017. And uh, I hope if you've had it, you get rid of it sooner than I did because uh, I'm, I've got one way to go, and that's to the doctor's office this afternoon. I will get better. <clears throat> Didn't, tr didn't twist my ankle, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, I have about 40 years experience in, in public education and meant much of that included uh, administrative duty. I was principal at Ledford in the late 70s. I was principal at North Davidson and then I went to Monroe for a short time and came back to Davie County as superintendent. Uh, if you know me and, uh, and I had any connection with you or your children at any of those places, please come by and talk to me. I, uh, one night we were here and we, we honored and recognized some, some students. And before we left, at, this was at a trustee meeting, and before I left, uh, a, a lady came by and said that I was her principal. She was, pro she was the typical student going, coming back to community college, getting some additional training, working on a different avenue for her. Uh, and then I sat at the table with two students who were volleyball players who had participated in volleyball at North Davidson and now playing here. So I, I have the opportunity to, to be around a lot of students still, and I certainly enjoy that. Uh, one of the things in my long-term commitment, frankly, to, to public education, is we've talked about four years and I'm hoping that Dr. Williamson is going to help us with that and come to a final finalization on how we do this. We've talked about that seamless transition for how many years and we're I think we're closer in doing it and I think one of the things that I talked to Dr. Ritland about when we first had the conversation about me coming on as a trustee is we have got to continue that process. I feel very proud of the fact of, of our involvement in, in Davy. I'm one of three Davy re, uh, residents that, that are on the trustees now. Very proud of what we've done over there uh, and continue. I, I continue to be amazed every time I drive by this campus considering what it looked like in 1978, 77 and what it looks like today. It's done a tremendous job there. Um, it is, a, it is a privilege for us to work with Dr. Ritland, and if you don't want to apply for a grant, you need to find another place. <laughs> <coughs> I've just determined. I, I've, I, I started making a little check sheet on how many grants. I lost count, but uh, I knew there were a lot of grants involved because we see lots of those through the trustees. Let me go on with the, the purpose you're here this morning, and we're very pleased to have Dr. James C. Jimmy Williamson with us today. He, on July the 1st, 2016, became the eighth president of the North Carolina Community College System. Uh, he brings extensive experience as a leader, innovator, proponent of community colleges, along with a background steeped in business, economic development, workforce development, and community service. Uh, he served as a, two years as a president and CEO of the South Carolina Technical College System where highlights of his tenure uh, included working with South Carolina University partners to smooth transfer pathways, chairing a special Senate proviso committee to develop comprehensive workforce development strategies to help close the skills gap. We're getting there. We're, we're, we're closing gaps every day. So I, I'm not going to read you all of this uh, except to say he has degrees from uh, two degrees from one uh, degree from the University of South Carolina, 
and uh, he is, is a Rotarian, so he's therefore certainly a good guy. Uh, been one of those for a long time myself. But help me, if you will, welcome Dr. James Jimmy Williamson to our podium. Thank you all very much. Oh, thanks. I got, um, I'm parked at the uh, front of the campus, and so I could tell exactly where I needed to go, but I couldn't figure out how to get here, so <laughs> I took the walking tour. What a beautiful campus, and I, and I noticed as I was walking, nobody was out and about, and I figured, well, everybody's waiting on me, so. <laughs> Bill, it's great to, uh, to, to be with you and, and to know those stories of how the connections work. Um, my official installation will be uh, April the 10th at Richmond Community College in Hamlet. And uh, I will be honored to have my kindergarten teacher with me and my eighth grade English teacher with me. So, um, so you, do, uh, you don't forget those people who were um, instrumental in, in your lives. Thank you for inviting me. It's, a, it's been a pleasure to, um, to serve for six months. It seems like yesterday. Um, <laughs> But you are my 30th campus so far out of 58. Um, I had hoped to hit all 58 before Christmas. That didn't happen. <laughs> so, um, in order to, um, to try to learn the system, and what you might have picked up is that my entire career was spent in South Carolina. And so I tell people, you know, not only am I having to learn geography, um, because I knew, you know, I just knew a little bit about the state. I knew we spent some time, we spent a good bit of time in the western part of the state, up in um, uh, Watauga County, and we had spent time over in Brunswick County, you know, vacationing. But the other 98 counties, I had probably not not attended or not not uh, visited, other than Mecklenburg County, because I uh, did my undergraduate and masters at Winthrop. So in order for us to have any entertainment, we had to go to the great state of Charlotte, Mecklenburg, right? So um, <laughs> had a, had, that was my only um, real involvement with North Carolina. My wife and her family uh, were from uh, Halifax and Weldon, Roanoke Rapids, up in that area, and we had visited there. Um, but it, this is a big state, 100 counties, 58 colleges, 120-some campuses. Um, it's phenomenal. It is absolutely phenomenal. So it is truly like drinking from a fire hose. Um, but I'm learning it. And, uh, you know, add to that the um, having to try to figure out uh, who the, uh, the key players are in the General Assembly and trying to visit them and form relationships with all the, both the internal stakeholders and the external stakeholders. Um, I've been rather busy, but it has been, I'm, as I have told my board, I'm having the time of my life. What an incredible system this is. And I will tell you that of all those campuses that I have visited thus far, 30 to today is the 30th, there is something outstanding and stellar about every campus. Everybody has something to be proud of. And, so, and it's so unique and it's so diverse. It's as diverse as our state um, and, it, and it tells me that we are truly focusing on the communities that we serve. And so, you know, one of the things that I told the staff um, when I first met with them in, in July was um, at the central office, um, we have to be value added. If we are not value added to what you do, then there is no reason for us to exist. And so the 250 plus people who work at the system office have to think every day about the decisions that they are making and how it will affect the community colleges that we serve. And if they are asking themselves, does this add value or does this add an impediment, they better be erring on the side of does this add value. <laughs> we don't educate one single student at 200 West Jones Street. It happens right out here. You know, the, the North Carolina Community College System educated 730,000 North Carolinians. And I say North Carolinians, even though we have some out-of-state people, I say North Carolinians because we primarily serve North Carolinians. We educated 730,000 North Carolinians on 8.9% of the budget, the, higher, the, the total education budget in 15-16. We can't do that any longer. We cannot do that any longer. 
And that's where my job comes in, not to dictate to you what needs to happen at the local areas and, and at the local communities, but to provide support for you in the classroom, in the student services, in the administrative functions, uh, to make sure that you are able to educate the students who come through your doors. And I'm honored and privileged to do that. In order to get the, um, to try to get a handle on um, uh, how big we were and, and try to get to know as many people as possible, uh, we, we put together a listening tour. And you know, the state is divided into eight prosperity zones. And so we had 10 listening tours across the eight prosperity zones. We had a, a host college and we invited uh, the president and the president's board chair. Um, and we just, I just spent time listening to them and trying to, to hear what some of the issues were. Um, it, it, bridging the gap is, is something that, that did come up, a skills gap. Really what I think we have is an interest gap. We know, we know that we have all these jobs out there that people can't, that the employers can't fill. And we know that we have people in our pipeline or should be in our pipeline that can fill those jobs and have rewarding careers and rewarding lives. What we have to do is convince them that there's a match there, there's a synergy. We have to bridge that interest gap. Now, yes, they do have to have the skills, and we have some things in place that, that are helping with that. But we have to make sure that people see the opportunities. How many of you could say, could, by a show of hands, when someone comes on this campus who's never been on this campus, and they live in the area, and they say, gosh, I didn't know you all did all that. Raise your hand. That happens every single day on every campus in the North Carolina Community College system. We got to fix that. We've got to make sure that people know who we are, what we do, and what our capability is. Um, you know, interesting. Uh, I've had a couple of, and 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 uh, I know that that the uh, the notes ask that I talk a little bit about my vision, but also a little bit about what's going on, what I see happening in the General Assembly, both uh, at the state level. Um, and then certainly at the national level. So I'll try to address some of those. But, you know, there have been a couple of things that have been just really, um, that, that, that have, have stood out to me uh, within the last 48 hours, I guess. Uh, I do a lot of traveling, as you might well imagine. I listen to NPR all the time. It's a great source of news. I mean, I'm flipping it around all the time, but I generally go back to NPR. I heard, today is Thursday, I heard Tuesday, that all the people, no, I heard it this way, those individuals born in 2017 will not require or need the skill of driving. And then yesterday at the um, North Carolina Economic uh, Chamber's Economic Environment Outlook, it was put this way, all the people who need to have the skill of driving have been born. Think about that. Think about the fact that of all the people that are around, those people who will be coming to you or coming to us in 15 or 20 years might not need that skill of knowing how to maneuver in a car. That changes a lot of what we do. <laughs> it changes a lot about the way we think about what we need to be training for. Now there will be jobs in the automotive and transportation and logistics industry, we know that. But there will be autonomous vehicles and that will be a skill set. And so then I began to reflect on that and think, well you know, you think back on it, 20 years ago, people were saying shorthand was a dying art, right? Well, how many people know shorthand other than the office systems instructors in here? <laughs> yeah, it is a dying art. It was a dying art, it was a dying skill. But what did we replace that with? We replaced that with keyboarding and information technology and all, and so, but, but 15 years ago, would we have known that, that we could carry around, I remember the first computer, personal computer that I ever bought was a Gateway 286. And I'm carrying around two high-powered Gateway 286s in my briefcase in a phone. 
I sat by someone from Oracle yesterday at the uh, Economic Outlook, and he said, you know, when, um, when uh, Steve Jobs was trying to, to pitch the iPhone, he couldn't show them what it was going to do. And he, and he had lots of trouble in trying to get people to, to sign on. You have to sell a vision. We, have to, we don't know what the future is going to hold, but we do know that there are certain things that we have to preserve, and that is the ability for our students to learn a new skill, to be adaptable, to be flexible, and to be able to, uh, in, the, in the words of, of uh, Wayne Gretzky, skate to where the puck is going. Who knows where the puck is going? But we have to be able to prepare our students to get there. And the way we do that is by focusing on basic skills, soft skills, communication skills, um, giving them the ability or teaching them how to think and how to be problem solvers. There won't be people driving. They will not have to make split level decisions or split second decisions about uh, whether to veer right or to veer left. But they may have to make some decisions about how to fix the technology in that autonomous vehicle to be able to make it work. And so we have a big challenge ahead of us. We, are, we, are, we have to sell a vision to a population that doesn't quite yet know that they need our services. Um, but in order to do that, we have to talk about how we are part of the solution and, and how, uh, and, and, and really, um, as a result of these listening sessions, uh, we have to rebrand who we are, not market. Everybody knows, you know, you, you do a great job in your service area with marketing. I would venture to say uh, at top of mind would be uh, Davidson Community College, Davidson and Davie Counties in that, in that area. They would know who you are. They might not know what you do, but they know who you are. So you're doing a good job of marketing. What we have to begin to do is brand so that when people begin to think about how they can retool and, and reskill, they think first about the community college and then about other forms of higher education. Something else that I've focused on in this first year is building relationships, which we talked about. We have to be able to tell our story. Um, it, was, it was rather interesting yesterday, and I keep referring back to the, to the North Carolina uh, Economic Outlook, but it's rather interesting. We had um, Governor Cooper spoke to us before lunch. He outlined three initiatives, the first of which was um, Medicaid expansion, the second of which was education. He did mention and talk about community colleges. Um, the third of which was repeal of HB2. So sandwiched between Medicaid expansion and HB2, here's education. <laughs> but at least we have a seat at the table, right? Um, and so then later in the afternoon, um, we ended up uh, having a panel of four economists from all over the state uh, talk about some of the economic uh, forecasts. And so the first part of the presentation was fairly dry. You know, they talked about um, gross uh, domestic product and imports, exports, all those kinds of things, just basic metrics. And then the moderator said, well, what about the economic impact of um, of HB2, which we had four economists who were all in agreement that that was that there was a negative economic impact, <laughs> which I thought was kind of interesting. You had economists uh, commenting on social issues, um, but then it got to the point of workforce development and training, and and how how workforce development is intrinsically linked to economic development and to the prosperity of our state. And one individual from a university, which I will not name, <laughs> said the community colleges need to get out of the business of being junior colleges to the universities and start teaching technical and, and um, industrial courses. Well, that is true. And I am, rem remember, I am sitting in the audience. We didn't buy a table. I meant because we're so cheap. Uh, I'm sitting at the back of the room. <laughs> The only, the only thing at my disposal was Twitter. <laughs> and so I tweeted out, <laughs> we do need more technically trained people, but it costs money. <laughs> it costs 10 times more to train someone technically than it does in a college transfer. So fund us. The second 
thing that I, I, I held myself. I, I used my internal restraint. I didn't get into a Twitter war. Um, but I wanted to say to them, why would you not allow an individual who has taken in a nursing program anatomy, physiology, microbiology, why would they not get credit for that at a university level? Why would you not allow a CNC operator who has more trigonometry than a math major at NC State not get credit for that when they transfer? So we have to have the comprehensive approach. We cannot focus just on one thing. Now, yes, we teach those general education things because we know. We don't know where the puck is going. We don't know where we are, what we're going to have to do, in what our students are going to have to do in 15 or 20 years. But we do know that there are certain basic skills that they have to have. They have to be able to, to read. They have to be able to think critically. They have to understand quantitative measurement, all those kinds of things in order to be successful in the economy. So, off, off my soapbox about that. Um, forming relationships is something that's very, very important to me and something that I hope that in my tenure I will have the opportunity to learn more about what you do um, and get to know you on a one-on-one on -one -on -one basis. And it is kind of hard to do, I understand that, but, but maybe through the associations and through your participation and your professional uh, association, we'll get to know each other one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. It's very important for me to be able to pick up the phone um, and to call or text a House or Senate member um, to tell them what's on my mind and what, what I think is going to be a positive or negative impact for our system. And in order to do that, I have to have their cell phone number. And in order to do that, I have to have a relationship with them. And in order to do that, I have to spend time with them. And so um, I, am, I am happy to say that I have, have had the opportunity um, through this tour to really spend some quality time with some key leadership in the House and the Senate. To the point that uh, NC Gap is not dead, it will resurface. Um, and uh, one of the senators before Christmas said, I know you're getting tired of call me, me calling you, but I may call you over Christmas break. I said, that's fine, call me anytime you need to. Um, but we have to have those kinds of relationships because we have to depend on them. They're making the decisions and they have to be informed about what our needs are. The third thing that I had um, uh, decided was first we had to have value, had to add value. The second thing was we had to have strength of relationships. And the third thing uh, that I was insistent upon and am insistent upon is that we, I have to help you find the resources to do your work. Um, you know, you, we all have lived through um, management flex. I will tell you that that term no one at Jones Street in the General Assembly even understands or remembers management flex. And so when we begin to talk about our uh, proposals moving forward, our financial ask, our, our legislative priorities, we can't use that term management flex even though we know that that's what we're, we're out to do is to restore some of that money that we had earned that they took away from us. We have to couch it in different ways. And we have a huge ask. Um, my, my opinion is if you, don't, if you don't ask, you don't receive. And so we're not going to be shy or timid about any of this. And I know that there will be House and Senate members who will probably try to laugh me out of their office when I go and talk to them about our legislative agenda. And I have, I have already hit some, some resistance. But I will present it unapologetically because these are the needs that we have. These are not wants that we have. These are the needs that we have in order to be able to respond to the economic uh, outlook of this state. And so my job between now and whenever they go home, and we hope it's fairly short, <laughs> and that they don't come back, <laughs> six sessions in 2016. That is the, since they've been keeping records, that's the, that's the most number of legislative sessions that they've had. Six in one year. Hmm. So we're hoping that 2017 is only just one <laughs> and that it's very short. But my job, my number one job, is to represent you in the General Assembly. Um, what do I think is going to happen there? I think that they'll, come, they'll be back next week for an orientation. Uh, they come back in the end of January. 
they're not going to be thinking about money or budget or anything like that until March because they have redistricting that they have to take care of. Um, and they're going to be more concerned about redistricting and uh, then looking at elections. And so if you got tired of ads before, more ads are coming, I can tell you. <laughs> Um, we need to be quietly working behind the scenes, um, which we are, and then when, when it's time to, to really make the public appeal, uh, be ready to go so that our request does not come as a surprise to anyone. Um, and so that's what we'll be doing uh, at 200 West Jones Street to represent you. You know, it's interesting, interesting times in which we live nationally as well. Um, and I heard another commentary uh, last week that, that community colleges may very well fare well under the Trump administration. It was kind of interesting to see who was considered um, for Secretary of Education. You know that uh, Dr. Zeiss from Central Piedmont was considered. He was on a short list. Um, and so that tells me that there was some um, some awareness of the role that, that community and technical education plays uh, in, in his mind, or at least in the minds of the people who are advising him. Um, next month, or, or, or this month, we will hear from David Bain, who is the, um, um, the, the Director of Legislative Affairs for AACC. His job is in nothing but lobbying in Washington. He is, he is, is I've known David for many, many years. He's very good at what he does um, in terms of being able to tell us uh, what's happening and what's brewing and what's coming up. And so we will hear from him about, um, about what, is, what is happening and, and the hot button issues. We know that, um, and, and North Carolina is well positioned um, on the national front, I think. Um, the Higher Education Act will be reauthorized, we hope, in 2017. We had heard that, that year-round pale was a hot-button issue that the, that, the, um, that the, the Congress had passed and the Senate was going to, or vice versa, the House had passed, the Senate was going to ratify before Thanksgiving. Um, and we got on the, on the horn and really tried to, to affect some change there. Um, at that point, um, it was before the election, nothing happened before the election, um, and then everybody was in shock after the election, so nothing has happened on that front at all. But our, um, our silver bullet there uh, is Virginia Fox, who is chairing um, that committee and also chairing the Education and Workforce Committee. And Virginia and I have, um, we, we text once a week. Um, she knows, she, she keeps telling me, you don't have to tell me this stuff. I said, yeah, I know I don't, but if I don't, then I don't know that you don't know. <laughs> so um, I, I can just, just know that I'll continue telling you this. Um, but, but she has assured me that, that those are the things that, um, that, that year-round pale is something that she is interested in seeing happen, uh, higher ed reauthorization. She's very concerned about completion rates. Um, and, and, the, and the time frame, and I think we all are concerned about that, 150 um, percent. You know, some, some people are proposing that there be a 300 percent time frame for completion. Uh, we know that that is reality for some of our students, but we also know that that doesn't play well in Peoria sometimes. Um, so we're just going to have to walk that tightrope. Tight um, so I, I, I tell you all that to tell you um, wait and see what January 21st brings. <laughs> Um, who knows what uh, will happen in Washington um, and wait and see what January 28th or something like that when the general, North Carolina General Assembly comes back into session. If you've got a crystal ball, uh, pull it out, share it with me. Um, <laughs> if you're hearing anything, let me know. Um, any questions? It, is now a good time to take questions? Be glad to do that. Somebody's got a question. <laughs> Let me talk to you about the elephant in the room at the, um, at the listening sessions. Anybody ever heard the word data tail? <laughs> Have you ever heard it called data hell? <laughs> I was a registrar early on in my career, and I was responsible for implementing uh, SIS version 881. Anybody in the room remember that? 
is the precursor to <laughs> to data tail colleague data hell all that stuff <laughs> then we went to SIS plus and then from there where did we go it got sold a couple of times the company has never changed <laughs> um, they, they, they sell you this I, the, the most amazing thing that happened to me in my career was that we had bought information builder uh, to do the the queries the the, the ad hoc reports and so I go to uh, Reston, Virginia, which is where they were based, for training. We were there for three days um, in the middle of the winter. It always snows when I go to Washington. I don't care what time of the, the winter it is. So it starts snowing. We get to Reston. We're sitting in this, there are just a few of us from our, our school, and we're, we're going to be trained on Information Builder. Oh, you forgot to buy the file structure for that. So we had paid to get there, <laughs> had paid for hotel rooms, all those kinds of things. We were getting our free training, but we had not bought one important component <laughs> that cost $20,000 to make it work. <laughs> so I'm on the phone trying to explain to our president why we're in Washington trying to figure out how to use uh, a component of DataTail that we really need an emergency procurement of $20,000. <laughs> It didn't go over well. <laughs> we did get what we needed. Uh, we were trained. Um, it was cumbersome to work with. Um, you know, we we are um, we are we are mandated legislatively to look at our um, our our computing. Um, there was a, a bill proposed that required uh, that we have um, an ERP analysis. Uh, and that we begin to really look critically at where we are um, from from an administrative computing uh, perspective, and so we now have an RFP on the on the street to I think it's the RFP for the RFP, um, so that we can get an unbiased approach to look at what our needs are system wide, and then figure out what the solution might be. And my suspicion, just from, from 30,000 feet looking at it and looking at where we are, is that it won't be one comprehensive solution. It will be multiple components that will work together to, to handle all the variety and the variations of things um, that, are, that are indigenous to our state. I'm still trying to figure out why North Carolina is on an accrual accounting basis as opposed to cash accounting because every software that is written is based on cash accounting <laughs> no one can give me the answer to that um, the university system gets around it by uh, doing everything on cash accounting and then doing a big data dump and conversion at the end of each month to be able to report uh, in a, in a, in a um, accrual basis so you know I, I don't know it's what I will ask you though is that whatever the solution is let's try to live with the vanilla version at least for a year to see what the the um, implications are before we start tweaking it and changing it because right now we have 58 different versions of data tail out there 58 there might even be a 59th that we don't
know about. <laughs> Untold resources are being expended in that one area, and that's an area that we have to get a handle on. So uh, I'll ask for your support. I'll ask for your indulgence as we move forward with that. Um, that's something that, that will be very, very important to our system. Um, and, but something that, that is, um, we, we can deal with this. We can, we can make this work. So. Can I just share with everyone uh, some of the prior budget priorities? Sure. Um, and I don't have my cheat sheet with me, I don't think. Do you? <laughs> I know I'll miss some. I usually carry this with me and I, I remembered and, and I was on the phone with Mary Shooping this morning and I thought she needs to send me this email uh, electronically but anyway um, it, you know we ended the session um, last year at the 11th hour um, the 59th minute the 59th session sec second and lost 10 million dollars 10 million dollars in recurring salary dollars could have gone to you all and, and had to be made up in some other way because I'm sure that you hired people based on the assumption that $10 million would be there. And so um, our board has had, over the last couple of months, I've encouraged them to have conversations with key House and Senate members. And so what they do when they come in, um, they'll have a, 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 an interest lunch, uh, um, the, the issues lunch I think is what they call it. And then they have their committee meetings. And at the end of the day, they'll generally have a House or Senate member come in, one or two, and talk to them and just have an open conversation about what do we need to be doing, give us some pointers, that kind of thing. Well, Representative Craig Horn said to them and pointed to me and said, between now and when we come back in session, every time you see me, you should point at me and say, where's my $10 million? And so every time I've seen him, I mean, every time even tuesday night at the at the lieutenant governor's uh installation i said where's my 10 million dollars how are you doing tonight <laughs> so first thing is the technical adjustment making sure we get that 10 million dollars back adding an additional 10 million dollars um for for salary because we would have been asking to to continue in that vein anyway so we're, we're hoping that there would be um and that there would be an en enrollment growth adjustment. These are some, some technical adjustments that we're asking for right out of the chute that before we even get into the negotiable things, these things have to happen. So that comes up to about $19 million. Then we thought about um, different ways in which we could um, ensure that we have a highly skilled workforce pipeline. You know, we, we hear a lot about the skills gap and about how we keep, how we keep that pipeline primed. Um, I've started challenging House and Senate members too because they talk about STEM all the time. Do we have any cosmetology instructors in the room? Okay, that's a STEM related program. Head and neck anatomy and chemical reaction, tell me that's not science. It is. And so are you talking about STEM related things or are you talking about um, highly skilled or high paying, although a cosmetologist can become an entrepreneur, and most do. And that's, that's a skill that we're teaching as well. So anyway, we're, we're just, just not to get off on that, but to talk about how, we, um, how we, we begin to take a look at um, uh, what we're, we're doing in terms of training that, that pipeline. Um, we know that we need to invest in workforce training. One of the things that, um, that, that I've noticed, and, and you all may as well, um, information technology people, people who work in um, the uh, the academic, I mean the administrative computing. Raise your hand. Anybody? IT. Um, most of those people, most of those people, um, you may or may not have a straight bachelor's degree, uh, but many IT professionals have cobbled together certifications, third-party external certifications that they put together and they are a highly skilled employee at that point. There is no way to pay for that training though. They can't use Pell and unless they're working with an employer that will do some sort of tuition reimbursement, there's generally a big expense at the end of that training to take a certification exam. 
So we're asking for some short-term workforce training uh, money that leads to industry credentials. We're asking for 15 million there. Um, we don't know yet whether our I think that historically, and Dr. Ritling, you may be able to speak to this, the, the funding, um, the tiered funding, was sort of just, just sort of like throwing a dart on the wall and saying this is sort of the way we think that, that we need to, uh, need to structure it. And so we need a study to, to really take a look at, at our funding structure and see, to see if it's fair and equitable within uh, the 58 and to, and to really get a handle on how we're funding certain programs. Um, when you start up a new program, you have lots of um, cost associated with hiring a faculty member, securing equipment, um, doing all, maybe buying software or other materials. Um, we need a startup fund we do, because we don't get the benefit of that program and those FTEs often until two years or more later. And so we need a startup fund so that if a new industry located in Davie County today, you could put in a new program and have something to draw upon. We know that uh, career coaches have worked, um, and so we're asking for additional career coaches. Are there career coaches in your service area in some of the high schools? We have them, but we're not funded from the system. I see. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, that's been a, a, a really innovative and creative uh, way to, uh, to, to really provide the kinds of, of branding and awareness that we need. Um, these, of course, are community college employees that are embedded in the school system um, and talk and, and they are unbiased but they're talking about the career opportunities that are available. Um, we need to um, focus some some money around uh, student completion. Um, you know it's it's when our, our enrollments are certainly driven by the economy and when people are out of work they're coming to school and then when they get a job, they drop out or they stop out. But when your enrollment is, is at a very high level, you probably have had to add additional staff in uh, student support services, uh, administrative services, and then when that enrollment drops, you just can't let those people go. You've still got to have those completion services, uh, those wraparound services. Um, and so we're asking for um, 22 million there. Um, and then we're asking for um, giving us some reward for, for, um, for college outcomes. You know, we, we, have, we have all these performance measures and one of the ones that's coming into play this year is whether or not students get, um, have a, a meaningful wage gain. Um, if they come to us and they may or may not complete, they may not ever want to complete a certificate or diploma or an associate degree, but they need a particular skill set to, um, to increase their earning potential and maybe to get a raise. And if we begin to look at and capture their, their wage information and figure out um, how we can get rewarded for uh, bringing someone to that next level, uh, we're asking for some money there uh, as well, additional money in that performance measure. That comes up to a whopping $45 million uh, in year one, and then this is a biennium budget, so in the 40, 47 uh, in year two, because we don't have the recurring money with the study in, in year two. Um, and then we need to, um, we need some stop loss, you know, just to fall in that same line of, of reasoning. Um, you, you all, high department heads, you're having to ramp up when enrollments grow. Um, and then you may end up hiring uh, full-time faculty or you may convert some adjuncts into full-time um, and, and you need some, some insurance that you're not gonna, we're not going to lose funding just because our enrollment takes a dip one year uh, over a, a three or four year period. So some sort of stop loss uh, provision is what we're asking for, four million dollars there. Um, and then an enrollment growth reserve, uh, five million dollars. And then we are asking for this General Assembly and this administration talks about taking care of the K-12 teachers and their teacher salaries and now we're talking about principal salaries and that's fine 
and they need that and don't take that away from them but we need some salary money as well because our faculty you know I was asked yesterday as I was sitting um, at that uh, forum um, what some of the greatest challenges were in terms of recruiting faculty I said being able to offer a competitive wage with what the industry provides because you have someone who comes in who has uh, a state-of-the-art industry credential they can make a heck of a lot more in the private sector than they can make with us and so so we need to do something as it relates to to um, faculty and staff salaries the other thing that we're doing you know we talked a little bit about um, NC gap and I don't know how many of you sort of got in the weeds with that but that was that was interesting I was I was being interviewed for and and applying for this job as that was playing out in the General Assembly that and HB2 and so I'm on the phone with the uh, search consultant saying are y'all really sure you want me to come to North Carolina um, but um, but NC gap um, in our in our perspective was rather punitive if you if a student doesn't score at a certain level they may get relegated to a community college well it does a lot for our image doesn't it you know um, and so what we have proposed and have had some some um, significant um, interest in is we, we have made we have metrics we have data to show that our students if they finish an associate degree and then transfer to one of the UNC system schools that they do better than the native student GPA wise if they have finished with us if they have completed now the student that transfers that's not necessarily true and it's not true on all UNC campuses but it is true on the majority of the NC camp UNC campuses and so what we're asking the General Assembly to do is to consider incentivizing those students who come to us first give them a five thousand dollar two thousand five hundred dollar grant each semester fall and spring five thousand dollars a year to come to uh, once they complete an associate degree with us then to transfer on to a senior institution if that's within their 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 academic goal so you incentivize the people to stay with us to come to us first stay with us and then move on and the reward is the grant that they get when they go to one of the UNC schools we've had um, I've had a couple of influential senators um, think very highly of it I've had one influential senator push way back so we'll see where that goes it's not this is not money that would take away from what we're doing but it is a it, we are offering this as an alternative to the punitive nature of NC gap and so if if we need to be viewed as problem solvers here's a way potentially General Assembly that you could solve this problem so it's a pretty heavy lift um, when you when you begin to add all that up it comes up to about 74 million dollars revenues are high you know we keep hearing revenues are coming in um, we don't know how much excess money they'll have now's the time to ask for it if, if we're not asking for it somebody else is remember we're educating 730,000 students on 8.9 percent of the of the total education budget as opposed to the university system educating 250,000 students on 22 percent of that pie I'm not proposing that we take away from them but I'm proposing that you give us our fair share um, and we will not back off of that so those are the legislative priorities they've been approved by uh, the state board by the president's association by the commit the uh, trustees um, I think everybody everybody that needs to approve it has approved it so anything you want to add Dr. Ridley? No, I think it's great thank you for sharing appreciate it questions I've talked a long time <laughs> over, over here Oh, you want me to talk for another hour, don't you? <laughs> you know, I, I am a huge 
proponent of apprenticeships. And, and the South Carolina Technical College System um, housed the South Carolina Apprenticeship Program, Apprenticeship Carolina. And when I was in the private sector, I developed the first healthcare related apprenticeship program in the state. It became a model in the state later in the nation. And so I am passionate about apprenticeship. North Carolina has been missing the boat for the last 10 years because they have been charging business and industry to participate in a registered apprenticeship program until the last two years. They have now decided to give uh, free tuition if the apprentice attends um, or, or some, some, some sort of incentive to, the, to having that apprentice take their courses at the community college. But South Carolina, on the other hand, gives a $1,000 per head tax credit to every apprentice that comes through the door that stays in the program for seven months. It is not the $1,000 that, that, that makes an apprenticeship program viable, but it's what it does for um, employee retention and, and reducing turnover and reducing attrition. We, I worked in long-term care and we had 13 facilities and we saw CNAs come through the door and walk out for 10 cents more because they were paying 10 cents more that day at another facility and we had worked to recruit and train and get the CNA ready to go. We put in a, the first program that we put in was a CNA apprenticeship program. We took our retention rate from about 100 percent loss or losing them, attrition, to uh, the first year out, 97% retention, and then subsequent uh, figures were in the 80% retention rate. This is, these are CNAs that are making 10 and $12 an hour, and they come in and they go through a registered apprenticeship program, and they stayed with us one year after they finished the program. We considered that a pretty, pretty good success. And so at that point, my boss said, apprentice everything you can. <laughs> and so we did. We apprenticed um, uh, mid-level managers, we, we apprenticed um, um, RNs, we did maintenance directors, we did food service directors, um, we did everything that we could to work in that apprenticeship model. It changed the scope and the nature of our company. Um, and, and, I, and I hear that repeatedly in manufacturing, in information technology, in healthcare, in all those sectors. Um, and, and somehow the word incentive in North Carolina is not a good word. But the incentive was not the reason that we did that, but it was the reason that we looked at it and then, and then what it did for us was the reason that we stayed in the apprenticeship world. So. It is. The people with the apprenticeship program, they have better retention rates, better customer, I mean, uh, employee loyalty. Right. You feel better about the company. Exactly. Something exactly. And there are ways, you know, I know that there's the, 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 the elephant in the room with an apprenticeship program is it, is it it's a U.S. Department of Labor um, program and they're afraid of, of unions and that kind of thing, but that's completely separate, completely separate. Um, you know, you look at look at Caterpillar in in Lee County. I mean, they 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 have apprenticeship programs going on all the time. We we've got to do more in the apprenticeship space. Um, I, I'll deny it if I if it's repeated out here, but I'd like to see that apprenticeship program come to the North Carolina Community College system. We can manage it far better than Commerce. So, we'll see. <laughs> One time, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yes. Um, so I have a question. Um, with all the talk about workforce development, pipeline, and things like that, we talk about a lot about severance and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And oftentimes, social sciences and humanities sort of gets lost back in here. And our former governor was a huge fan of some social science courses. Um, I wonder how do you propose to be supportive of those programs? Because those of us in that <coughs> discipline understand the benefit that you provide. Sure. But, um, Well, I think we need to talk about the comprehensive nature of what we do. Um, we are a comprehensive system. 
Um, and, and one of the reasons that I'm so impressed with the system is because we can take them from the from adult literacy. We have the, the literacy responsibility uh, in this system. And we can take them, in the, and, and I'm trying to remember the words of Dallas Herring, we can take a student from where they start to where they want to go. And, and I think we need to talk about that comprehensive nature. And that comprehensive nature includes um, all the things that you mentioned, human services. Um, you know, I, I have a guy some counseling masters and uh, cognate from the College of Social Work and gerontology. So I understand that whole piece of, of how important that is. Um, and when we begin to look at um, how we're going to meet the workforce demands, um, we know, for example, that, that aging services is going to be a huge issue for us. Um, by the year 2030, there'll be more people over the age of 85 than there are today over the age of 65. And so not only are we, are we, do we need to think about the allied health programs, but the social services programs and, the, and, and all those programs that, that speak to that population as well. So I think that we can't talk about one thing in isolation. We have to talk about, about everything and how it relates. And, and certainly, I don't, I don't want to see uh, those programs get lost in some of that. So, does that answer it, sort of? Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Well, thank you. I've enjoyed um, having the opportunity to talk to you. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, this is your 30th um, community college to visit, but we are um, positive that when you leave Davidson, you're going to realize we're the best. The best. Yeah. <laughs> everyone. Uh, Dr. Williamson is going to go on a tour of the campus and then following that he's meeting just so you know what his day is going to be like. He is then going to meet with some of our board of trustee members and a representative from our assembly and have lunch and discussion. So if you ever have any questions you want to share with him or with me, please do not hesitate. Uh, we definitely want to keep you in the loop. I will get on the schedule through Carlene our um, open forums. And um, thank you, Nathaniel, for videotaping all those and for folks to have the opportunity, if they can't get to an open forum, at least to, to see it. So I wish you all the very best this semester. And we have many opportunities and challenges ahead of us, but I know as a team we're going to make it happen. So thank you so much. Thank you.